In the realm of dental health, the idea of using a genetically modified bacteria to prevent cavities is actually a thing all of a sudden. Because tooth decay and cavities come from a handful of bacteria that I'm gonna cover later in the video, it's now possible to genetically engineer a few variants of these kind of bacterias in just such a way that they don't actually contribute to the enamel loss. So imagine cleaning your entire mouth out from all bacteria, then putting in a genetically modified version version of some of the same bacteria that will repopulate your whole mouth. But these GM bacteria are never gonna cause cavities. That's a pretty cool idea. I mean, I've certainly had my fair share of cavities in my life and it's not something that I thought was gonna be solved anytime soon, but the more I hear about some of these new startups and some of these new ideas, it totally seems like it's in the realm of possibilities. In fact, the whole idea of like crowding out the bad bacteria with these GM bacteria was not on my radar at all until this article ended up at the top of Hacker News. It's titled, Defying Cavity, Lantern Bioworks FAQ, a genetically modified bacterium that outcompetes the bacteria that causes tooth decay. So this uh, product, it's hard to call a genetically modified thing a product, but I guess it is if they've tweaked it in such a way that it's a product. And it's not even entirely out of the question that this is literally just a scam so I could be totally giving you bad information like I'm not promoting this thing but the pitch deck makes me feel like it's feasible the fact that the bacterium already exists and it's been derived from something since I think it was 1985 I had to just explore this concept to see if I can count on having a new type of bacteria in my mouth sometime soon and never having a cavity again that just seems kind of incredible and I haven't seen any other YouTube videos about it. Is this bacteria really safe? Like what could the knock on consequences be of like disrupting your mouth biome in this way? The bacteria as it's proposed actually secretes a little bit of antibiotic that it's not susceptible to. So if you kiss somebody, is it going to just instantly crowd out all the bacteria in their mouth also? And that might be good for them if they don't like cavities, but they didn't really ask for that genetically modified bacteria to take over their mouth, you know? How do we know that this bacteria isn't harmful in some other way because of its modifications. How much are you gonna charge for this bacteria and how do you enforce payment if it can just be like copied in a Petri dish? If it was in your mouth and you decide you don't want it anymore, can you even get rid of it? Like, was it susceptible to just normal antibiotics and you can put the bad stuff back in that creates the acid that eats your enamel? Is it inevitable that the ones that you're crowding out currently become antibiotic resistant at some point and then just work their way back into our mouth? What's the new byproduct if it's not something that's acidic, is that? damaging in any way? Is that okay if it's followed? If it goes into our body, does it go through the system? Like what, is that thing found in nature anywhere else? Can you prove that it's safe? Did the team that's trying to raise money to do this already put it in their mouth? So get ready for an incredible oral experience as we talk about all of the different bacteria that are probably in your mouth right now fighting for space and doing all sorts of interesting things to your teeth, to your gums, to your tongue, to the roof and bottom of your mouth. It's crazy in there. So collectively, all the bacteria that live in your mouth are called the oral microbiome. And the main way that it contributes to tooth decay is by metabolizing sugars and carbohydrates because it metabolizes them into a byproduct that's acidic. And as that acidic byproduct sits on your teeth, it actually tears out your enamel. So there's a lot of complexity in the way all of the different bacteria interacts with each other, but we're gonna break it down to the five most important, the top of the chart. And by far at the very top of the chart is a single bacteria called Streptococcus mutants. This is the most well-known bacterium associated with tooth decay. There's a number of reasons why it's so bad. One, its favorite place to live in the mouth is on the tooth. It just loves the outside enamel. That sucks for us. Second, not all the bacteria have acidic byproducts in your mouth, but this one definitely does. So it has a double whammy effect. And just to remind you, if you have any kind of standard American diet, the SAD diet like I do, you are covering your mouth in the kind of simple sugars and carbohydrates, essentially transforming sugar to acid. And that means soda to acid. That means cupcakes to acid and cereal to acid and all sorts of other things that are really easy to find in our diets. The next would be Streptococcus sobrinus. So similar to the last one, it does have a very acidic byproduct. It doesn't tend to always live on the teeth as often. It's also not as abundant in the mouth, but still a problem. Lactobacilli is another bacteria that also contributes to cavities. So it's less abundant in the mouth overall, and it actually doesn't have a super acidic byproduct when it metabolizes sugar. However, you find it in super high numbers once a cavity has started to develop. 
develop. Because the thing about this bacteria is that it loves to live on top of those acidic environments. And once you have a cavity forming, you've got like basically a pit, like imagine a hole in the ground where the water is starting to like flow into it. So even more acidic byproduct is going in there. And this bacteria loves to eat that. So it's in there too. So the acid's eating the enamel. This bacteria is in there eating the acid. And this bacteria also contributes to the lower level decay. And as you go even further down and you eat your way through, you end up with something called acinomites. So this is another bacteria that you find deep inside of a cavity. And when this bacteria shows up, you're starting to talk about the first stages of real tooth decay, particularly all the way down in the root of the tooth. So when acinomites show up, like you've got some serious issues in your mouth. And finally, a term you may have heard, but you might not have even known you were talking about a bacteria, gingivitis. Technically the full term, which I'm totally gonna butcher right now, is Porphomornas gingivalis, something like that, but it's the bacteria that's super associated with gum disease. And when this bacteria is all around the mouth, it helps support the pathogenic types of bacteria, which indirectly support more and more cavities. So now let's talk about this proposed solution. Enter the new genetically modified bcs 3 l one. Or you can just call it by its brand name, Lumina. And yes, it has a brand name because it was genetically modified. So it's not just a generic bacteria. It is owned by someone kind of. And if you had to guess what this bacteria is derived from, you can just go back to the top of that list I just gave you and notice that Streptococcus mutans is the bacteria that causes the most problems in our mouth. And that is also where this was derived from. So the bacteria was genetically modified in a way that gives it four different functions from its original derivative. The first is totally mind blowing to me, but it actually inside of its own DNA has the ability to make a protein, which is actually an antibiotic and secrete it. So yes, this new bacteria Lumina does actually secrete its own antibacterial that will kill the other bacteria in your mouth. We'll talk about this more later in the video, but I'm super hesitant about antibiotics. They're super overused. I think they're really damaging to your body, except for when they're not. There is times and places where they are a life saver, but most of the time they're just weakening your immune system. They're messing with your microbiomes, your gut microbiome for sure, but even the other biomes around your body. But I digress. The second thing that it's been modified to do is be resistant to that antibiotic itself. So it can secrete an antibiotic, but hey, it doesn't affect it. That's how you get the mass population of your mouth. Now third, it metabolizes the same carbohydrates and sugar as the original one does, but it uses a different pathway, meaning you don't end up with acid, you end up with alcohol. So now anytime you want to get drunk, you just eat a bunch of sugar. Boom. You're wasted. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's probably not, probably not enough bacteria in your mouth to get you drunk. I'm just saying. And the fourth one is probably the most interesting. It is built in a way where it lacks a specific peptide that its species of bacteria uses to arrange a genetic transfer with another bacteria. So it's also like in the Jurassic Park movies where like they're all women, they can't breed and like life might find a way, but they're saying, no, this thing doesn't have the peptide, it can't breed. So to recap, the antibiotics help with the Darwinian competition in your mouth. So it becomes king of the oral bacteria. The alcohol mechanisms mean that it can't provide any acid. So the acid never eats away the outer layer of your enamel. And that's before the other bacteria get into the cavity crust. So we shouldn't have to worry about them either. And then the peptide prevents it from transferring its bacteria into those other bacteria and it getting sort of loose into the wild, into our natural uh, oral ecosystem. Okay, so who's modifying this? Like, where did this come from? Who's doing it? Like, how are they messing with the genes? Well, you can trace it back to 1985. In the University of Florida, there is a professor there that's named Jeffrey Hillman. And as oral bacteria professors tend to do, he was taking the bacteria off of all of his students' teeth and putting them in petri dishes and learning about them and categorizing them. And he found one specific student with one really interesting variant of the bacteria. And this unusual strain of Streptococcus mutans came with its own ability to make that natural antibiotic to protect itself and its own immunity to that antibiotic. So those first two major things I talked about, they were built into this bacteria when it was found in 1985. And then from what I can tell, the way they got it to not actually generate the acid and to not have that peptide was just basically by trying to like 
mutate it, right? Like my guess would be they did something like they just kept hitting it with x-rays and they just kept letting it grow and they just kept looking at all the weird changes they were making to the DNA until they found these two. And even though this is something we could be talking about a technology like CRISPR for, I, this has been going on for decades. So that's the techniques that they were using back then to the best of my knowledge. So if you do end up wanting to apply this kind of bacteria, this is how it's going to work. You brush your teeth with basically an antibiotic and it kills everything in your mouth. And then you take a Q-tip, you dip it in this bacteria and you just start pushing it all around your teeth, a little bit on your tongue, a little bit top and bottom of your mouth, but mostly just like cover your teeth in this bacteria and just let it take hold and start duplicating, eat some sugar and boom, there it is all over your mouth. And the most interesting thing is this is not something you have to do each week or each month. They do one dose and it's essentially there forever unless you have like a true, you know, antibiotic thing in your mouth that cleans it all out and you have to start from scratch again. Like it's going to be there forever. So you might wonder, is it going to eventually take over everybody's mouth like a virus? Everyone who's kissed everyone, it goes in their mouth, they kiss other people and it just boom, it goes everywhere. And what these researchers would say is that that's probably not a problem because you got to remember it was found at first in one guy's mouth. So it's not like it went crazy. Somehow nature has a way to sort of contain it. And also the bacteria is unlikely to just jump into someone's mouth and take over their bacteria, I guess because they already have a mouth full of bacteria. So it's already crowded out anything new that lands. It's not gonna just, well, I'll just take over. Okay, now even though these things do seem to have their own antibiotics, which makes me skeptical about this claim, they say that somebody else's mouth is already full of bacteria and it's so crowded in there that there wouldn't ever be enough room for something like this to just jump through a kiss and then take hold in somebody else's mouth. But maybe enough kissing, a lot of tongue kissing, or maybe kissing right after somebody's had some antibiotics or an oral cleaning, that might be enough to make it take hold in somebody else's mouth. If you want to get rid of it, can you? Probably, but you'd have to nuke your mouth again. You'd probably need that same super bacteria killing antibiotic toothpaste and you'd have to clean the whole thing out and then put all the original, I guess you'd call it bad stuff, the acidic stuff back in. Yeah, and if you were wondering about that drunken thing of too much alcohol in your mouth, they actually did address that question. The researchers pointed out that most people already have some bacteria in their body and mouth that secrete some level of of alcohol. In fact, crazy side note, this is a real thing and it's called auto brewery syndrome. And that's actually a condition that really does happen in some people where bacteria that create alcohol gets so out of control that the person is just drunk all the time. They're always under the influence simply because the bacteria that just live on them and in them is creating so much alcohol byproduct. Like here in the case studies, you can see in 2019, a 25 year old man presented the syndrome. He had alcohol intoxication, dizziness, slurred speech, nausea. He had no prior alcoholic drink, but had a blood alcohol level of 0.3. But once he was given an antifungal daily for three weeks, that bacteria was gone and he resumed not being drunk all day, every day. So anyways, I just had to share that one with you. It's still in the sort of theory theoretical stage in the sense that they haven't done enough testing to get it approved by the FDA in any way. There's sort of some weird workarounds that they're working on too, where it might not need to be like full blown FDA type thing and it could actually be more approved as a supplement, which seems super crazy to me, but maybe not. I don't know if a bunch of dentists look at it and they want it, I guess it's safe enough for me, but I would love to see a one-time solution for cavities. It just seems like it might actually be possible. That would be really cool if that does get figured out and tested and enough people take it serious and it's looked at and it becomes a straight up product that we can all buy at a reasonable cost and save all of that pain and money. No way. So floss that subscribe button, help me get to my next goal, 9,000 subscribers. And thank you to my first $100 patron, Rob Brown. That means a ton. Anything you want me to like cover, send it my way. I would love to hear and learn about it hop on a Zoom, we'll chat, but uh, that's awesome. Like that really feels good to have somebody committing so much to the creation of these videos. So thank you, thank you, thank you.